Welcome all to the launch event for our new magazine, ChinaBooksReview.com. We went live last week with our first issue featuring a cover essay by Perry Link, Orville Shell's China Bookshelf, a review by Zheng Chuoran, one of China's Feminist Five, a roundup of new China books, and much more. Just today, we put up a new review of a very interesting title, a bestseller in China as yet untranslated. And earlier this week, we launched the China Books podcast, hosted by award-winning journalist Mary Kay Magistad. The review publishes twice weekly, online, and fully ungated, with reviews, essays, uh, archive picks, profiles, the podcast, interviews, and various book lists, including a comprehensive listing of upcoming and recent China books. So it's a real smorgasbord for all literary tastes. Our definition of China is broad, including the greater Sinophone world, and our remit for China books is also generous from nonfiction to translated Chinese literature and a column for what China's reading. We hope you find us a valuable and entertaining resource. Uh, we have beautiful art, so do click onto the website. Uh, and while you're there, why not follow us on social media and sign up for our newsletter? But today, we're here to celebrate the launch with a very special event, a sequence of mini panels with a rather enviable uh, roster, uh, an all-star lineup of China writers and watchers. We're calling this three generations of China writers for the three panels. And we're going to take you on a whistle-stop tour of the last six decades in China from the 1960s, uh, where it was all but impenetrable for outside observers, or all the way through to today uh, when the nation is tightening politically again, but there's just a wealth of good writing about it from a diversity of voices, both here and there. So uh, it's a lot to pack in. We have seven speakers, so at this point I must ask forgiveness uh, from the audience, but there will be no time for Q&A at the end of the panels. It would have been a bit of an operation to get everyone on stage, so uh, we ask your forbearance, but after the event is over at 8 p.m., there'll be drinks reception, just one flight of stairs up, uh, and so do join and ask us questions there over a glass of wine. So without further ado, let me introduce the first panel. Our theme is China watching and writing from the 1960s to 1989. Uh, so we're going to be taking you, or they're going to be taking you from the deep crimson depths of the Mao era um, all the way through uh, the opening of the 1980s uh, to the inflection point that was Tiananmen Square. Our guests of this panel are, on the far left, Orville Schell. Orville Schell is the Arthuros Director of the Center on US-China Relations here at Asia Society and co-publisher of the China Books Review. He is a former professor and dean at the Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism and author of over 10 books about China. He is a longtime and regular contributor to the New York Review of Books, the New Yorker, Foreign Affairs, and other publications, and has traveled widely in China since the 1970s. Uh, Winston Lord, on the far right here, was the US ambassador to China from 1985 to 1989. Previous to that, he was director of policy planning at State Department and as special assistant to Henry Kissinger in the early 1970s, he was instrumental in the US restoration of relations with China, which he visited nine times. He has also served as president of the Council on Foreign Relations and assistant secretary of state. Welcome, Ambassador Lord. They will be interviewed uh, in the center here by Jian Ying Zha, a writer and cultural commentator in both English and Chinese. She is the author of two books in English, Thai Players and China Pop, and six books of nonfiction and fiction in Chinese. Her work has appeared in publications including The New Yorker and The New York Times. She was born and raised in Beijing, educated in China and the US, and lives in between New York and Beijing. So, Jin Ying, uh, you have 25 minutes, give or take, <laughs> as best you can, on the clock to talk about this all. So, uh, good luck and uh, take it away. I'll need it. Okay. Um, Thank you and good evening. 
Uh, it's really an honor and pleasure for me to interview these two very distinguished um, writers and uh, statesmen. Uh, who needs no further introduction. But before we start, uh, let me ask Orville to make a brief few remarks, because Orville is really not only uh, a speaker here, but a host uh, at Asia Society and, and also the publisher of the new, our new venture. Well, I, I think we should just dive in and welcome everybody. I just want you all out there to know, I mean, what an amazing pleasure it is to be with Winston and Jenny. Uh, to look back at a period of time when China was utterly different. And I think it reminds us that as we uh, look at China today, that isn't the complete picture. That's one sort of evolutionary stage of China as it moves through history. And I remember so vividly when I was there in the 70s, when Mao was still alive, and Winston, of course, was there myriad times visiting Chairman Mao and Zhou Enlai, et cetera, that we thought that's the way China was. But lo and behold, it changed radically. And we're going to talk about that period because it was one of the most extraordinary periods of my life, the period from 1978 to 89. And I'll just end this little beginning remark to say that I remember when you were ambassador then, Winston. And I should say, Winston and I went to grade school together. Yes. So uh, we have a, a kind of a history here. Uh, I went out to, I don't remember why, to Peking University one morning. And in those days, I think this was 85, 86, there was a Chairman Mao statue still in front of the Beijing Library. I think they blew it up a short while later and hauled it off in the middle of the night. And I stood there looking at Chairman Mao and out at the buildings that, across the, the little lawn in front. And what was so interesting was that on all of the walls of those buildings, there were old Cultural Revolution slogans that had been painted over, yeah, but which were reappearing. The paint peeled off. And I thought to myself, hmm, is this saying something to us? And it turned out it was a perfect metaphor, I think for the indelibility of Mao's revolution and how it didn't just vanish when Deng Xiaoping came along and waved his wand and said, reform an opening. So. OK, Orville, I know we all love the 1980s. But uh, as a moderator, I feel sure. obligated to take us back to a, a darker and bleaker time. Um, 1960s, um, Perry Link. Uh, wrote this wonderful retrospective uh, from Mao to Now, which you all can read in the first edition of China Books Review. And in it, he said, during the 60s, the US officially sent more men to the moon than to China. <laughs> and China seemed like a Shangri-La. And you, Orville, wrote a very astute assessment of the uh, engagement policy in the wire China and you also cited some startling figures about the 60s. You said in 1967, as the race riots spread across the country and the Vietnam War raged on, an astounding 70% of Americans agreed on one thing, that is PRC formed the greatest national security threat. Um, now, I could testify that this was the same similar picture from the other end, because as a child growing up during the Cultural Revolution in Beijing, we were fed on a constant diet of anti-US propaganda. So even though none of us met a real American, but we all had fear and fantasy in our hearts. And then Winston showed up. And <laughs> no, don't skip. And they still uh, I, I know, yeah, well, I'm still <laughs> trembling here. But um, but then I, I, I think we, at that, that time, we thought we were going to grow up and you know, beat the paper tiger and liberate American people from the evil capitalism. Um, but you two, as you said, were schoolmates growing up in New York. In that era of utter isolation, how did you start to think about China or fantasize about China? Winston. You. Or oh, Winston. Well, in my case, <clears throat> I had the advantage of being married to a woman from Shanghai, 
So I was pretty well steeped in Chinese culture through her and her family and her parents I was very close to. <clears throat> but I didn't know much about China per se in geopolitical or historical terms. And I wasn't a so-called China expert. I was in my early government career. I dealt with a whole variety of issues. And it's only when I joined uh, Kissinger's Kissinger. staff in the White House in 1969 that I got involved in China. But even then, uh, it was only about 20% of my time because I was involved in all the other major initiatives as well. Um. So I, I went to China with little knowledge. And I'd have to say I, I didn't learn a great deal about it beyond meetings. Uh, you know, my, my perspective on China, as Orville's indicated, was five meetings with Mao, hundreds of hours with Zhou Enlai, and Peking but Duck. nobody yeah. with the China, nothing with the Chinese people except staged uh, events when we went on uh, tourist uh, escapades and so on. So we could see the bleakness, the fact that everywhere dressed either in blue or gray, that there were countless bicycles and very few cars, all the usual cliches of the period. And we, of course, knew that everything was a Potemkin village that we were shown. Uh, so it was exciting, it was dramatic. The gulf that you mentioned about each side fearing and not understanding the other shows you what the leaders on both sides had to overcome in terms of vision and courage. But in terms of learning about China and the Chinese scene, all I can do is say that uh, it clearly was a bleak atmosphere, and I spent most of my time in Dayutai in the Great Hall of the People. So. Yes, and uh, I was actually um, shoveling snow with my school friends we were ordered to clear the road for Nixon to be on top of the Great Wall. That was as far as we got to see the Americans. But um, Orville, I know you also made your first visit to China in, after the Nixon visit, and you recalled it as a very restricted and lonely time. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about that, but I know later, soon, in our beloved 1980s, you went many times and, and you made friends actually and you met your wife. And um, you also wrote Disco, Disco and Democracy, which I think was a lot more appealing picture to a lot of us than say market and democracy later. But could you describe your trips to, to China and how you felt uh, on the ground? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the things that was so important about being in China while Mao was still alive and the Cultural Revolution still went on was that it was, a, it was like a, 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 a milepost from which you could judge all future changes. And I mean, I spoke reasonably good Chinese then. I'd even had a Chinese girlfriend in Taiwan. And I thought I basically knew how to navigate a little bit, you know. I got to China and I felt completely insoluble. And I spent several months there working, so-called working. Uh, this was a youth work delegation that Zhou Enlai had arranged uh, in, in a model agricultural brigade and then in the Shanghai Electrical Machinery Factory. But as Winston said, uh, you know, a Potemkin village, when it came to foreigners, there's some incredible and permeable membrane that existed. And I'm sure you felt that too. Nobody was allowed to really interact in a meaningful net way. So that was a really important experience, although very confusing. Because when things started to open up, and then this British diplomat, Roger Garside, wrote this wonderful book about the late 70s called Coming Alive. I mean, I felt China came alive. It was like a black and white picture that suddenly turns, has color. And it was very important to be able to recognize what it had come from. Because it, and I, I will just finally say, just remember that there are many, many deep wellsprings of different influences within China. And at different times, they surge, wax, and they wane. And it will continue to happen. It's the most unresolved society and country, I think, I've, of consequence that I've ever been in. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of the color, I remember uh, as a middle schooler, we were all uh, gazing at uh, Mrs. Nixon's brilliant red, stylish uh, red coat on these uh, official newsreels. What did but, you think? Um, I think 
in spite of all the anti-bourgeois campaigns I grew up with, there's a little petit bourgeois <laughs> in me and a lot of other girls then. But uh, by the 1980s, I was in Peking University. We were all hungrily reading all the translations of foreign books. And I went to these um, dance balls um, wearing self-made belgums. So this was the time of your democracy, I mean, disco and democracy. But was that um, like such a special time that we would think now as an aberrational period? Because let me turn to you, Lord, Lord Winston, <laughs> Winston Lord, your Lord. highness, uh, <laughs> because you were at the heart of the ice-breaking historic trips. You were actually physically the first person landing in China before his injury, because you were in the head of the plane, I heard. Thank you. But in 19... <laughs> 85, you returned to Beijing with your wife as the ambassador in Beijing, and you were able to um, travel, I'm sure, much more freely. And even as a fledgling Chinese fiction writer, I heard so much from my writer's friends about the salons and the parties you and your wife were hosting at the US Embassy, which actually attracted both writers, artists, reformers and government officials. Can you describe to us about that honeymoon period? Was that like a second act of what you had previously started? Well, as Orville said, the contrast with the 70s was extraordinary. I was very fortunate because I arrived in 85. We had eased tensions on Taiwan to the third communique, and relations were beginning to warm up, and I left on Hu Yobang's funeral, the first major demonstration when everything went downhill. So I was there doing the most open period. It's all relative uh, and the best period in U.S.-Chinese relations. Now, a couple of caveats before we emphasize the openness, which should be emphasized. Uh, it was still a communist society. Let's not fool ourselves. And even while we were there, the discussions on political reform and the movement forward and economic reform was more fits and starts. You had, after all, spiritual pollution, bourgeois yes. liberalization, the four cardinal principles, as well as advances. You had, after all, Hu Yabang being sacked after demonstrations in Shanghai, Christmas 86, and he was sacked in 87, and things tightened up. But on the whole, even during those periods, uh, it was extraordinary how you could communicate and who you could see. I mean, to this day, we went to all kinds of universities, maybe you and one of our Audiences, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I was there for Democracy Salon, which we'll get back to. Uh, there the questions would be scripted, uh, but think tanks were more open and productive discussions than you have today. That's, mm -hmm. I guess, a low bar, yeah. but it's still or ever <laughs> since. To get back to your point about the embassy, my wife, being a writer and a dancer, had great uh, entree into uh, the reformist and artistic circles. Of course, our embassy was very vigorous in this, too. I want to put it all on my wife. And to talk about what we did at the embassy. We would have small working dinners where we'd have government and party officials and reformers and mild dissidents, not bomb throwers, but people pushing the envelope. We had one, a small dinner party with Deng Pufang, the crippled son of Deng Xiaoping, with reformers around the table. Then we would have bigger dinner parties, and my wife had to figure out how did you overcome protocol obstacles and also mix reformers, academics, government officials, media types, business people. So what she did, she seated everybody by the astrological animal they were born <laughs> under. So all the years of the tiger and the pigs and the uh, dragons and everything else were at those tables, but it, it affected uh, the mix. So we had uh, extraordinary discussions. I'll just find a couple other anecdotes, because I'm going to give Orville some time here, of what we could do outside. We also had dancing parties with mm. Chinese officials and so on. It was really something you just can't replicate today. Uh, but it was not only what we could do at the embassy, what we could do outside it. Mm. My <clears throat> wife was the first woman maybe the only woman ever invited to speak at the National Defense University, uh, the equivalent of our West Point. She's allergic to alcohol, and of course they had a small dinner afterwards. You know how Army and Navy people like to drink and Mao Tai, and she tried to put water in her glass instead of Mao Tai, but 
Nevertheless, at the end of the evening, she had to be sort of carried out, but it's extraordinary <laughs> that uh, she could do that. Uh, I introduced the Super Bowl on national television. I played against Lee Pong in tennis and mixed doubles. The results are highly classified. So <laughs> we could travel wherever we wanted to without delays or lack of access. Uh, again, the conversations could be guarded. People were still careful. But it was an extraordinary period. I'll give one last example of the closeness and the openness. Uh, my wife went to, as a Chinese American, more than the wife of the ambassador, to various leaders' homes. She, the homes of Fang Lejeur and Liu Bi Yan. Uh, her book, Spring Moon, was translated while we were in China by the wife of the vice minister of culture. And when she was on her deathbed, she had done the whole book except the final chapter, and lamented on her deathbed that one of her big regrets, she couldn't finish the translation, which is quite moving. So her husband, the vice minister, a famous Chinese actor named Ying Lo Chen in The Last Emperor and so on, translated the final chapter. So we had that kind of interaction, openness, events at the embassy and getting around China that is just mind-boggling today. And, and Orville, you were um, making so many friends um, among the Chinese artists and scholars and business, and you were kind of already quite committed to the cause of the liberal dissidents to the extent that you and your wife, I think, were like fundraised and hosted a large forum uh, of these dissident types um, in your California home. This was already 1989, I think early in the year. Did you have any inkling of what might have been coming at that point? Or are we also uh, boiled up by great optimism, uh, or you might say high on hopism, uh, hopium, that, um, that we just didn't see what was right around the corner? Well, I'd have to say that if you mark the major inflection points, of Chinese history since 1949. We haven't seen one of them coming. You know, we didn't see Deng Xiaoping's ascendancy after the Cultural Revolution. We didn't see the arrest of the Gang of Four. We didn't see 1989. We didn't, there are many things we didn't see, and we certainly didn't see Xi Jinping coming. We thought history had a nice Hegelian trajectory and was chugging along towards greater openness and convergence. Well, that, 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 that's not true. Um, I forget what your question was. <laughs> oh, so, well, you already said basically no, no one. Uh, none of your Chinese friends or American friends. I don't think so. anybody, anybody saw it, but I think everybody was so sort of intoxicated with the fact that, we, that, that not only were things more open within China itself, but that we could interact across that impermeable membrane that was once what Chinese called guanay, inside China and outside China, that that had sort of broken down and, and allowed all sorts of interesting things to happen. And um, it, it, from that perspective, I think it was, it was so exciting. And I remember going to parties at Winston's embassy. It was truly um, uh, uh, almost normal. And, and <laughs> unimaginable now, absolutely unimaginable. But not that China is incapable of that, it's just that now it's not happening. Could I However, a couple of can caveats? I ask you? Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me, yeah, just very quickly. Yeah. Again, as I said earlier, we don't want to overlook it was still controlled, obviously. Yeah. It's all relative. I'll just give uh, three anecdotes yeah. uh, very quick to, to prove that this was still a controlled system. We, we brought over from the National Portrait Gallery, we're going to bring over a big exhibit of uh, famous portraits. Chani said, we can't have Golda Meir and General MacArthur for reasons I don't fully understand, MacArthur maybe career. Uh, and so I said, no, we're going to either have the whole exhibit or not at all. So the whole thing was canceled. But they see even the little things like that were there. I had to rescue the New York Times reporter John Burns, who was arrested because he was traveling in an area that was, he hadn't been cleared for. And that was a very close call. Clearly wasn't a spy. And they kicked him out I, what? later, they, later well, on. Well, we saved him from a trial, because yeah. everyone knows you get to trial in China, you got a less than a half a percent chance 
to being acquitted. So the idea was to head off the trial. And we said, which happened to be true, that he was there to write about Deng's reforms. He actually wrote a positive piece, not to spy, uh, obviously. And finally, whenever my wife went to a bookstore where they were selling Spring Moon, there was lots of people there and all kinds of Spring Moon books. As soon as she left, they were all taken away. There were no more copies. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you, yeah. you get those certain reminders. Excuse yeah. me, I cut off your question, but I wanted to make sure we understood that this was a remarkable period, but even yeah. then it had its limits. Yeah. I was going to raise the Fang Lijie incident, but before we get to that, I was going to ask you, since you, unlike Orville, did not start your career as a China hand, so Kissinger involved you in all kinds of countries and regions, so you always uh, probably had seen China in a global context. Sure. Did you um, sort of agree with Kissinger's ins insistence that China should be judged uh, mainly through, as um, he said, I think geopolitics trumps all other considerations, including the internal, I mean, domestic ideology. Do you think in retrospect that might be one of the blind spots that that blind all of us to the monster within that is going to rear its head somehow, somewhere. And we were all like, um, myself included, seeing 1980s in some ways, the sort of a bizarre, comparable counterculture movements like you witnessed, you grow up in the 1960s, right? So we all had this romantic kind of picture of China re-emerging or merging into the world, into the normal uh, global uh, world, communities, but it's not. So do you think we're, there was a lesson to be kind of drawn, I mean, from the vantage point of now, but? Well, given our limited time, I, I really can't do justice. We, we could both spend hours on this, and you could as well. It's the whole question of engagement and expectations. Very quickly, let me say, when we went in the 70s, we had no illusions. We didn't know the four horrors, maybe, of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, but we knew we were dealing with ruthless people. In the Cold War, and it wasn't just China, you often had to deal with unsavory regimes to balance the Soviet Union to head off a nuclear nightmare, which was the overriding objective. So I'm not saying that Kissinger should be confused with Mother Teresa on human rights. I'm just saying <laughs> that we all felt, Nixon, Kissinger, myself, that we had to sort of hold our nose and deal with these yeah. people for the greater goods of stability. Over the years, more issues arose, certainly after Tiananmen Square, and human rights did and should take a larger role. Very quickly, we had hopes that China would replicate Taiwan, South Korea, Chile, Indonesia. As they got richer, they'd begin to ask for political reform. Uh, we weren't naive about it. We hedged. This, I'm talking about several decades, several administrations. Mm -hmm. uh, we got some value out of the engagement. Uh, some people were over-optimistic after Tiananmen and the massive demonstrations. I was hopeful. But I don't think any of us based our policy on that expectation. And it was only going to be a matter of a, a major benefit in addition to the other benefits we were achieving. But we, I don't think, at least I personally don't feel most of us were that naive. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's really important to remember, as you pointed out, Winston, that despite the incredibly tectonic reforms that, that China did undergo, they never rearranged the political structure which they had borrowed from Stalin's Russia so that the ministries, the party, the whole organization of it was still there. And so there was some, some basic fundamental genetic material of sort of one party state governance that, that never got altered. And I think that's one of the things that made it so easy right up to Xi Jinping. So that when he came around, the structure was still there. And all of the, the tools, although they hadn't been used to the extent that they are now, were all still there. And he just kind of reanimated this old system. So it just goes to show that um, you know, there are some people who think that the reason why the Chinese really despised Gorbachev was that he wanted to fundamentally change structures of, of Russia. And that's why the party, you know, if there's anything they agree on, is we don't want Gorbachev. We're not going to do reform. 
because we know where that leads. It leads to the end of the empire. It leads to the end of everything. Uh, and th they, that's, I think, what helps animate what we see going on today. I think, I, I'm, I think everybody knows, both of you also, post Yemen, have become, uh, from the Democrats or Republican side, very outspoken critics of the post Yemen um, US uh, you might, some might say, um, a more appeasement kind of attitude towards China. Um, so, I mean, I think that's going to be left for the next panel. Uh, to wrap this up, we have like two minutes, maybe one minute each if you want to say something, um, whether anecdotes or insight or um, still, um, you know, about the 80s or up to that inflection point on Tiananmen Square. Very quickly, before I do, I want to congratulate uh, Alec and Orville and David for launching this. It's a book review. I'm going to give a book review. Everyone has got to buy Orville Shell's novel, My Old Home. <laughs> it's one of the yes. two best novels on China I've ever read in my life. I mean, <laughs> that's you, serious. All right. Now, I'll just Second conclude that, yeah. by saying there were two canaries in the gold mine in the late 80s amidst mm -hmm. this openness. Mm -hmm. The first one was when I went to Peking University Democracy Salon with my wife. Uh, had a tremendous discussion. It was run by Wang Dan and others who were going to exactly a year later lead the Tiananmen Square demonstrations. We didn't realize how sensitive things were. But the canary came three days later. Deng Xiaoping sent me a personal note to the then ambassador to the US, Han Shu, saying, you shouldn't be going seeing these students. I went back politely, but basically said, I'm going to continue to see these students. I want to see the young people and get around as many Chinese people as I can. Uh, we wouldn't tell Han Xu, you, Han Zhu, that you couldn't go to Yale or Harvard and so on uh, without permission. So for the next two weeks, all my speaking engagements, think tanks, universities were canceled mysteriously. But they finally got over it. But that was a harbinger of how sensitive yes. in 1988 mm -hmm. June they were. Mm -hmm. And then the final canary in the gold mine, I don't have time to do this justice. <clears throat> The new President Bush came to China in February uh, 1989, and the Chinese were willing to ruin his trip because they were so sensitive about dissidents. So that's a way to sum it up. Uh, so it just shows you that at heart, uh, Deng Xiaoping was a Leninist, and uh, as, as the rest of the uh, group. Basically, we invited some dissidents, including Fan Lejeune and his wife, to a banquet that Bush was giving uh, as a hospitality gesture back to the Chinese as part of a huge list of several hundred people uh, to be put at, not at a major table and no press conferences. The last minute, the Chinese said the leaders wouldn't go if, if uh, Fang Lejeur went. Uh, we hung tough. They finally relented, said, OK, we'll show up. But then they blocked them after all and blew up the summit. Uh, President Bush proceeded not to blame the Chinese for doing this, but to blame me and the embassy for inviting these people in the first place and say we hadn't cleared this and so on. We this cleared was it twice the time the when White House. Perry Link walked him. That right? Perry Link yeah. was the one who was with Fong and his wife at the time. Yeah. So that was another example of the Chinese nervousness of what was coming. And this, of course, is only three or four months uh, before Tiananmen. Yeah. Thank you. And Orville? Well, just a final thought. Uh, you know, I think as intoxicating as that period was, and as exciting as it was, um, it raises the very vexing and, and uh, question of can reform actually be effective on a one-party Leninist state? <clears throat> or is it doomed from the beginning? Because the minute things begin to get really reformed, the party begins to get really restive and, and concerned. So I think that's kind of, and, and now I think the leadership in China has concluded, no, you can't have reform. It leads in only one direction to the end of the Leninist state. And uh, I, I conclude very sadly that that may be the lesson of the 1980s. And um, uh, I lament it. But um, I'm not sure where that leaves us. But it's, it, it doesn't leave us. You know, one word, one expression the Chinese Communist Party really loathes is, is something that we all would think very highly of, namely, Peaceful evolution. Sounds very good. But no, the party absolutely eschews it. 
they make a desert and call it peace, <laughs> right? Well, you could say, I suppose, I, um, that's pretty extreme, but maybe. I didn't uh, say it. No, okay. <laughs> Tank just well, said it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, mean, I think I, it's relevant. It's relevant. I mean, I, I, uh, it's hard to know. All we know is history keeps going, and history keeps surprising us. And China has vast reservoirs of different forces. Um, Ian Johnson, who you'll hear from in a minute, just has written this wonderful book about sort of underground intellectual currents that don't express themselves publicly, but aren't, aren't, haven't vanished. God, Orville, I'm glad you circled back to your implacable, inflappable optimism. <laughs> In the end, I thought I, you were I, on the verge of I, I becoming a, a <laughs> historical determinist. <laughs> but anyway, I think on that uh, note, maybe we should um, uh, applaud to these wonderful remarks and, and stories you. to our two graduates. <laughs> We'll give the floor. Uh, in just uh, half an hour, uh, I've long felt that perspective is the most valuable commodity for those among us who follow China. Um, as Orville said, history marches on, so thank you to the three of them for lending their perspective to us. We're going to do a slight change of the guard um, while they switch mic microphones, but while they do so, um, allow me to introduce the theme of our second panel. The theme of this panel is China writing and journalism from the 1990s to 2020. Now, the 90s and the noughties, or however you're meant to pronounce that decade, uh, perhaps the noughts, um, despite the fallout after Tiananmen, were perhaps, in hindsight, a relative golden age for China journalism and books. Uh, our panelists are exemplars of both that, but also of the changes in the 2010s when it became more difficult to report on China and still to remain there. So we welcome, on the far left, Ian Johnson. Ian Johnson is a Pulitzer Prize winning writer and senior fellow for China studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. He first went to China in the 1980s as a student in Beijing and then Taipei, before returning in the 1990s as a foreign correspondent until he was expelled from China in 2020 while working as a journalist for the New York Times. He has published four books about China, most recently Sparks, China's Underground Historians and Their Battle for the Future, which was released last month and which will be excerpted at the China Books Review shortly. He will be interviewed by David Barboza, a former business reporter for the New York Times, who was based in China from 2004 to 2016. He won a Pulitzer Prize in 2013 for his reporting on the extended family wealth of former Chinese Premier Wen Jiabao. For more recently, he is co-founder of the digital news magazine The Wire China and its data analytics platform Wire Screen. And with Orville Shell, he is co-publisher of the China Books Review. So David, uh, you have 20 yes. minutes yes. absolute maximum. Thank you, thank you. Um, so uh, to cover the best part of three decades, so good luck. Big challenge for you, Ian. 30 years, 20 minutes. <laughs> no problem. Let's get going. First, let me say, I, after listening to the last panel, I was really bummed out. I was in Beijing 84, 85, and I never got invited to any of those parties. <laughs> and when I miss, I was pulled up in Beida. You know. That was going to be my first question. The yeah. dancing parties in Beijing, were you there? I was um, not there. I was but somewhere. let's, you know, uh, they sort of ended in 89. Uh, I'd like to start in 94. You returned to Beijing. You had been a student at Beijing University in 84, 85. You'd actually studied reporters, and I think your paper was... How did yeah. North, North American journalists cover China? Right? Yeah, I wrote a, my senior thesis on that. And I interviewed John Burns, uh, who yes. we mentioned, and yes. other people, Amanda Bennett, who's with the Wall Street Journal, and others, just to find out what they, how they did their work. So. Yeah. So you had this great vantage point coming in in 94. Baltimore Sun, then the Wall Street Journal, then the New York Times. When that first few years in the 90s, what was it like? What was your approach to journalism? Now that you had already studied, you know, what was good and bad about those North American journalists? 
How did you uh, see it? I think what I got from those uh, interviews that I did for my senior thesis uh, was that people were, mainly because they had so little access outside of Beijing, it was hard to leave Beijing, or I think you couldn't leave Beijing or Tianjin without permission from the local mm -hmm. foreign affairs office, the Y ban, uh, that they ended up doing a lot of the same stories. And when I got back there in 94, I was lucky because I was working for the Baltimore Sun and then the Wall Street Journal, which both wanted, they, they, they didn't want me to duplicate what was on the wires. Mm -hmm. So the Baltimore Sun said, unless the president's coming to visit, um, you don't need to da do the daily news, do other things. Lucky you. I was lucky, yeah. And then the Wall Street Journal at that time viewed itself as a second read newspaper. Mm -hmm. So we, we figured that you're subscribing to your local newspaper, be it the LA Times or the New York Times or the Kansas City Star, to get the local news, you get the Wall Street Journal for other things like business news and also social trends and stuff that you don't find elsewhere. So we, had, we were sort of trained not to cover all of the, the breaking and daily news, which was a great advantage because then you got to go off and, and do the more interesting things that despite Tiananmen were still happening in the 1990s. Right, and what were the kinds of stories you wanted to pursue if you had that freedom Many of the people at the Times don't have that freedom, or maybe as much as the Journal or the Baltimore Sun. Did you find, I know, you know with your book now, I would like to call you almost like an immersive journalist. You like to get out of the mainstream, go to the rural parts of the country, see things that others don't. Did you start that in the 90s? Was that part of what you started to do? Yeah, I think, I think that's fair to say, yeah, for sure. Um... I wanted to, I was always interested in religious questions, and I kind of mm -hmm. grew up in a, a religious household, and I was always interested in what are people's spiritual beliefs and so on. Mm -hmm. So even then, I had these ideas. I was going to write a book on religion in China. I didn't do it for another 20 years, but, right. Um, right. but I began to go around and talk to people. I got to know um, nuns at a, at a nunnery outside of Nanjing that mm -hmm. I've been going back and forth to see for the past 30 years. And so, yeah, I, I was able to go off and do different things. Even then, I was, when I was hired by the journal, I was their first macroeconomics reporter. Mm -hmm. So that, but that also involved a lot of traveling around to see what was actually going on right. in terms of economic right. reforms. And did the, you said you're interested in religion. Did that lead your, you know, your most famous, at least your Pulitzer was, covering Falun Gong, the crackdown on Falun Gong. Were, were you coming at that already because you were interested in religion, or was that just... I'm interested in religion, and this story just landed in, and yeah, I pursued it. Was, it. Um, actually, a colleague of mine at the Journal, Craig Smith, had already done an interview with Lee Hong. Yeah, he did an interview with Lee Hong Jer, yeah. I think, yeah. and he had had identified this as an interesting group. But then he left and went to the New York Times, in fact, and so um, and I, then I was like, oh yeah, I'll do, I'll do this story because it's so interesting, and. Uh, then I followed them for, for quite a while, even after the crackdown, which mm -hmm. was really violent. And often, it's one of those stories that's sometimes overlooked, I think, in the coverage, because Falun Gong has this reputation, not entirely undeserved, for being sort of eccentric, silly, right. nutty, right. cultish, with yes. um, various claims that never pan out, and so on. But they were really victims. And, um, mm -hmm. I mean, we documented more than 100 people who died in police custody because of police mm -hmm. brutality. And thousands were sent to labor camps because they wouldn't right. renounce Falun Gong. Right. So it was a, a huge crackdown. And I think it showed, picking up on that theme from the last panel, that mm -hmm. any time the government sees structures, organizations that's outside of its control, any real civil society, mm -hmm. it's highly skeptical and then tends to try to <coughs> right. end it. So one of the big questions I get often is, are you followed? Is there surveillance? What was it like? In the, I, I got there in 2004, you were there in the 90s and in the 80s. What is it like to be on the ground? Surveillance at that stage, after the Falun Gong reporting, what do you find, were you under pressure during that period? Did they threaten to kick you out at all? No, at that time they, they didn't. I, there was always the police surveillance that you had to deal with or the, the restrictions on journalists relaxed in the 1990s, so there was still formally, you couldn't leave Beijing or Tianjin without permission, or you couldn't do reporting. You could leave as a tourist and say, right. you know, go to Xi'an or something like that. 
but uh, to do reporting, you were supposed to get permission, but they didn't really enforce it. So you could go and tell the Foreign Affairs Office, so I'm coming to Xi'an to do some stuff on the coal industry, can you show me around a coal mine, and get there a couple days early, mm -hmm. uh, or stay a couple days late, depending on, on the thing, and then you could do some interviews. Once I went to interview a dissident in Beijing who had just been released from jail, mm -hmm. he had been involved in Tiananmen, and I, I went to his home, he invited me to lunch, and, and I, we were late. We couldn't find his place, and I got there at 12.30, which in Beijing is insanely late for lunch. Mm -hmm. So I was at 11.30 or even 11, if you're being cautious. And it turned out that he was, his house was, being, was under surveillance, mm -hmm. and, but everyone had gone off for siesta. So right. I got in there, and we go in, and we have our lunch, and we're talking, and all of a sudden, like at about 2 o'clock, there's a knock on the door, and it's the police. They come in, you know, what happened? And this is like a nefarious trick of mine to mm. come at 12.30 when they were having their siesta. And then the, my, our handler at the, foreign, at the foreign ministry came in mm -hmm. and said, you know, what happened and so on. But it was pretty mild. It was just a okay. reprimand. Yeah. So, I mean, even over that period, you were there 90s, 2000s, 2010s. Were you ever detained? Uh, ever, like, followed by, I mean, I was followed all the time in China. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I was a business reporter. Actually, we should turn the table. I mean, you were, inter you were um, researching the, the personal finances of the, of the premier. I was followed before that. Yeah. So, <laughs> I and, understand if I was followed after that. But and I was you were the New York Times, yes. I think, because they have a hierarchy of newspapers that they hate. I see. And at the pinnacle is the New York Times. Yes, yes. Because yes. I remember talking to, I wanted to interview Hu Shu Li in the 1990s. And mm -hmm. she was, uh, hadn't yet started her magazine and all that wasn't yet so famous, but she'd written a book about journalism in America. Uh -huh. And so I, she, she came over to, to meet me in the Jingle Gen, Y area, and I said, is it difficult to meet me? And she said, well, you're an American journalist, so it's bad, and you're a white guy, that's bad, because it's obviously <laughs> a meeting of foreigner. It could, and then she said, but at least you're not the New York Times. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was like, okay, it's a small, yeah. I mean, a couple of times, I remember going to do a peasant, class action peasant lawsuits, which mm -hmm. I wrote about in Wild Grass. Mm -hmm. And the local foreign affairs, or the police chased us out of the province. We were in right. Ningxia, and when we left the provincial boundary, mm -hmm. they just stopped. But they were kind of chased us out of that area. OK, so I'm kind of amazed. I, I did that story in 2013. I was only there a couple years after that, where I really would be intensely followed. You were there over decades interviewing dissidents for your new book, Sparks. You're interviewing underground historians, people who are sort of on the edge, or at least challenging the state and authority and the conception of truth. So I wonder, even when you're doing that, you're apparently not followed that often, but are you coming up with strategies for who are going to be my sources? How do I protect these people? Um, Will I name them? You know, how, yeah. how did you think about um, developing a relationship with a dissident, meeting them, sourcing from them, naming them? How do you? Uh, you know, I remember when I was dealing with, say, farmers in, in China in the 1990s, they were, farmers like to have the most bravura, bravado there. You interview them about some taxation issue, and they'll take their ID card, their Shen Fen Zhang, and they'll say, take a picture of this, and you tell Zhang Zemin that, <laughs> right. da, 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 what he, and then, then you're kind of like, maybe I should coach this person. <laughs> maybe we'll just anonymize you, uh, and, and we won't put your Shen Fen Zhang picture in the newspaper. But I think with other cases, I, I, one advantage I had is that in 2010, I quit daily journalism. Mm -hmm. So I was with the Wall Street Journal, and I quit, and I was, my accreditation was picked up by the New York Times. But for the next 10 years, um, I, was a, I was on my own. I was working as a freelancer. And that allowed me a lot more freedom to go visit people at different times mm. of, 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 the, of the day, the year, whatever I was. And I guess you just uh, ask people whether it's safe or not. It's, occasionally, mm -hmm. there was cat and mouse stuff. I remember going, trying to go see the Tibetan poet Wozer, and she was coaching me on how to get into her apartment complex and avoid the, the police or something like that. Mm. But most of the time, uh, I found that if you avoid people at sensitive dates, right. around Tiananmen, it's sort of you can follow all the people you know, some of the time, some of the people yeah. all the time, all the people right. some of the time, but not all of them all the time. 
And it was kind of like that, because I think even today, people overestimate the surveillance state. And maybe it will be, I don't want to say overestimate it, but they think it's all like some mega computer with AI, mm -hmm. and through these cameras, they can figure everything out. And that, that could be coming, but I think it's still very labor intensive. And they need a lot of people. One of the people I, I interviewed for the book, Sparks, uh, was uh, ran this underground magazine and now is retired and living. It runs a little cafe on the outside, outskirts of, of uh, Chengdu in this tourist town. And he says there's like eight or ten people. He counts for eight, 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 I think, or ten people who regularly f are watching his cafe. Mm -hmm. And so you, you just see that's just for one old guy. Right. Uh, and you multiply that. It's impossible, I think. So the, main, the best thing is don't interview people around June 4th or right, right. October 1st and all those other holidays. Right. I love the story in your book about uh, you're going, I think, if I have the story right, to this underground sort of historian. They're holding sort of discussions of books and, and uh, politics. And there's this person there who's from public security, but apparently not following you. This was, right? Am I right about that? Maybe he was like, <laughs> or he really did was he tell you that? I mean, did uh, you tell no, he tell that story a, about He was a, a cop, right? right. So he wasn't right. the people, he wasn't a, uh, that kind of a, a public security thing. Right. But he attended there because he found it interesting and he wanted to learn to educate himself. So this was a public space in Xi'an called I Know I Know Nothing, mm -hmm. which from that Socratic uh, aphorism or paradox. And it, he just went there because he, found it fascinating and he learned, he, he told me a story about how he learned to be more tolerant and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Um, but, because I asked him, he said, I'm in security. And I said, mm -hmm. oh, you mean like you're a bao an at a, at a thing? He says, he said, no, he said, police. <laughs> and they're like, oh, I gotta go now. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. So most of the time when you're talking to sensitive people, they know the lay of the land better. And, uh, and then you just go by their instincts. And if they can't call it off, then you just call it off. Right. You know, the earlier panel was talking about this golden age of the 80s. And I tend to think the period we were there, and I was there part of the time you were there, to me that was the goal. I wasn't there in the 80s, so I don't know. But we had access to so much on the ground. They, uh, at some point, they, the government said, you don't need permission to visit other cities. My first years in China was, I need to then call the government and ask them for permission. And occasionally a government person would say, just pay us you know, $500 and we just will let you come and we won't you know, shadow you. Um, but you needed to have all that. But then after the Olympics or around the time of the Olympics, all of that was canceled. We could travel almost everywhere. As long as you weren't doing something really political, I'm, I'm a business reporter. I felt incredibly open, and I, maybe you also felt this is, or did you feel, um, that that period in the, from the 90s to maybe the 2010s, is that the most open period? And, and I mean, it, it's not just about openness, um, it's also about access. And I feel by the time I was there, I could, I could be anywhere. I could get access, I could read things, I could go quickly. I could get behind the scenes, occasionally followed at the hotels. We could lose them. Little Keystone cops, you would try to get rid of the, the followers. Um, and people were receptive to being interviewed almost everywhere I went, um, yeah. which is kind of remarkable. Yeah, I think in terms of so intellectual openness, mm -hmm. maybe more, there was more on the table in the 1980s. But it, by the 2000s, with the rise of the internet, and blogging and stuff like that, I think a broader swath of people mm -hmm. had access to more information. That's one of the theses in Sparks, really. Yeah. But in terms of working as a reporter, uh, it's no doubt that by the 2000s, it was really a golden mm -hmm. age because also the infrastructure in China was so much better. It used to exactly. be so hard to get anywhere. Right. Right. The trains were slow, the planes were erratic, the roads were terrible. But by the late 2000s and early 2010s, you could, there was the high speed rail, the, the roads right. were getting right. better and better. I had a driver's license, I could just quickly rent a car, mm -hmm. um, and from Shen, was it Shenzhou rental car, and you yeah. know, they had an app, you could just go arrive in a town, rent a car, and drive off, and uh, you could talk to all kinds of different people. You know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is one of my surprises in China was whenever they say this is not possible, 
it's not possible there are documents um, on the families of the senior leaders or something. In your book, Sparks, you have this chapter about this magazine called Spark, um, which you write about this discovery, really, this magazine, I think, from the 50s, two issues maybe. Can you tell the story of how something that definitely should be censored, never see the day of light, the light of day, never come out in a Western journalist's book, how does that magazine surface? And how did it surface? Yeah, that is the power, in some ways, of, of, of basic digital technologies. That So after the Cultural Revolution, many people who were rehabilitated were able to look into their personnel file. Uh, or through, through various ways, were able to, to get a look into their file. And there was one woman who was involved in Spark. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a student-run magazine that analyzed all kinds of the causes, the root causes of the Great Famine. Lack of freedom of expression, mm -hmm. lack of checks and balances in the one-party state, et cetera, et cetera. But as you said, it was closed down. People were arrested. Three people were executed. Uh, others were sent to labor camp for 15 years. But in the 80s, she looked into her file, and she took pictures of everything that was there. And there was everything in the file. Mm. Uh, and this sometimes happens in bureaucratic states, that stuff gets disgorged in ways. Um, Tiananmen Papers and, and so on is an, another example. So I think that th then what happened was it sort of sat around in her apartment in Shanghai until mm. the advent or the, uh, the spread of PDFs, which mm. we take completely for granted. But people said, oh, you've got all these photos. We can reconstruct the magazine and just create a PDF of that. And all your police records, your, the confessions, the love letters mm -hmm. that she wrote to her boyfriend, they could all be spread by PDF. And that's a powerful tool. It's like a modern day Zamzdat publication. Right. Um, and so that's some way like a weapon of the week in a some right. digital or authoritarian resistance. It's not to say that there's a panacea or some Pollyannish view that technology will triumph, because it's very asymmetrical. The state still has overwhelming power. But there are some ways that people can fight mm. back. So a final question for you, Ian, which is, of the people on the stage, only one was expelled. So I, maybe I should have been expelled, but <laughs> I was not. But you were part of that group, unfortunately, in 2020 that was expelled. The American Journals, I think about a dozen. Um, have you been back since you've been expelled? Can you go back? What does it mean for journalism? from the West or from the US to cover China yeah. um, with almost no one on the ground. Yeah, that's one of the many, in 2020, the many self-owned goals that the uh, Trump administration fired um, by expelling Chinese journalists that invited an inevitable retaliation. I think the 58 Chinese journalists got expelled. But uh, I think as Richard McGregor said, it's like in chess when you're exchanging rooks for pawns. because the whole US press corps was gutted because of these expulsions. Yeah. Yeah. There are just a few people in China now who can work. And they're so overwhelmed with daily news, they don't get a chance to travel that, as much as they'd like. Mm -hmm. uh, I was back there in May. I now work at the Council on Foreign Relations, which I think that association probably helped me get a visa back. But mm -hmm. I did not go to report as a journalist. I, I ended up writing a, a long article for foreign affairs, mm -hmm. but they wanted they wanted to know explicitly if I was going to go work for the New York Times or something mm. like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I set an alarm. It's <laughs> 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 just my reason. <laughs> I know we were told. Anyway, um, um, and so, yeah, uh, I, I think. So maybe a final thought on, on how are we going to cover China without, with very few reporters in there? Yeah, I guess I will get into that with the, in the next panel. But yeah. I think we have to take a more syncretic view. There's, there is still a lot of stuff you can get when you're outside China. Mm -hmm. But we just, just in some ways, like the people I write about in the book, they're active inside China, but they have a lot of ties to people outside of China. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot more flow back and forth in, the, mm -hmm. in ways that weren't possible before. Exile communities in the past tended to be really just exile communities with no ties back to China. Right, right. And now you see a lot more fluidity and likewise with journalism, we can try to patch things together. It won't be as good as having resident correspondence, but right. it's still some way and, um, to do it. Great to be with you here. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David and Ian, for that 
rollicking tale from the front lines of journalism. And uh, what a shame that the golden era had to end. So uh, we've got current, more or less. Uh, and this brings us to our third panel, uh, the theme of which is writing about China today. So now there are fewer English language writers uh, living in China, uh, although still a lot of China books coming out. Um, and of course, there have been translations of Chinese writers, mostly fiction throughout. Uh, and now finally, there are more Chinese voices in the mix. Uh, in any case, to talk generally about the state of China writing today, or whatever you want to talk about, we have two wonderful writers up on stage together for the first time. Uh, on your right is Yang Yang Cheng. Yang Yang is a research scholar at Yale Law School and a particle physicist. Born and raised in China, she has written many essays about Chinese society, science, and politics in such illustrious publications as the New York Times, The Atlantic, and very soon the China Books Review. She will be interviewed by Jia Yang Fan on the left, who is a journalist and staff writer at The New Yorker. Jia Yang lives in New York. She moved to the US from China at the age of seven and is currently working on her first book, Motherland, which will be published next year. Jia Yang, you have 20 minutes. This is going to be a marathon, shot right? On the clock. Go. <laughs> um, I have to say, being up here feels a little bit um, like time travel. Um, there's a real surreal quality to it, not least of which because um, when I was in uh, two years into my, um, into being in the US, I was assigned this book um, in, uh, in the year of the boar and Jackie Robinson. And uh, it was the first time, I barely knew English, it was the first time I read about a heroine, a Chinese American girl, who was, uh, who was not unlike me. And um, her name, Betty Bao Lord, you know, it took me a while to learn that, oh, she took the name of her husband. And I thought to myself, you know, who is this lucky fellow that um, got to marry a Chinese American um, writer? And uh, today I met him for the, um, <laughs> For the first time, and uh, um, uh, you know, before I grill Yang Yang, um, and I will, you know, get to that uh, very shortly. I have to say that um, uh, you know, ten years ago, or maybe fifteen, when you get old, you lose track of time. I remember fact-checking um, uh, Jian Ying's article on Wang Meng, um, her profile of a former. Um, culture, a uh, minister of culture of China. And it was the first time I realized that it was possible to write in English about a divided Chinese American self. And um, to this day, that article, I think, of all the New Yorker articles I've checked and read has left the deepest impression on me. Um, and uh, it's, um, I don't think it's an accident that was written by a a Chinese American woman. Um, in the meantime, um, I have read the works and admired the works of everyone who's been on this stage. And it's very humbling to read um, the works of non-Chinese scholars and journalists who know so much more about your homeland than um, you ever thought you knew. So I don't want to discount that um, by any means. but. Uh, you know, when I first read um, Yang Yang's work, I saw in a way a reflection of um, Jian Ying in the sense of there being such an original um, and probing voice that um, comes from a divided self, one that is both Chinese and American, one that does not have necessarily kind of a very straightforward role model, one that is clearly inspired you know, by all the um, China scholars and um, watchers that have come before. But there's a probing quality in um, Yang Yang's uh, originality of voice. And that, to me, is tremendously moving. Um, and uh, I'm really 
I, I feel really grateful to be on, to be sharing the stage with you, um, uh, Yang Yang, and, um, and not least of which, we share um, not a, a phonetic character in our name. So I don't really believe in fate, but it feels only kismet um, <laughs> that um, I, should be, uh, I should be here with you. Um, so I'm so intimidated by the fact that you started off as a physicist, a job that I think um, requires a few more brain cells than that of being a writer. Um, that's just my opinion. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask, what made you decide to, to write about China? I mean, being a physicist feels like the hardest job and the most rewarding job um, there is to be kind of um, trying to understand the nature of reality. Um, what, um, what marked that transition for you from physicist to writer? Well, thank you so much, Jiayang. And, and I should preface this by saying that the first time I encountered Jiayang's words, and that was, um, I wouldn't necessarily say life-changing, but I think um, it was not just what she was writing, but also from her identity and her background, it felt like permission to me. And to that, I remain extremely grateful. We planned this, by the way, mutual uh, <laughs> ego rubbing. This is clearly just part of, the, part of the event. But thank you for saying that, Yan Yan. And also, Yan is my mom's uh, surname. And so you could see how much effort my parents put into naming me, since raising me was already an impossible task. <laughs> and, and that comes back to the question of why I started writing, since uh, my formal ac academic training and my my previous career was indeed in physics. And, and actually, a lot of people also asked me why physics, and my response was always because I could not do anything else. I cannot carry a tube, I'm terrible at sports, I have no talent, and physics is actually uh, quite easy. I think it's much easier than writing um, to me. But, but for me, when I was uh, growing up in China in the 90s and early 2000s, um, as a young child, I always had this urge to express but basically, starting in middle school, my mother banned all extracurricular reading and writing. And, and so even before I understood political censorship, to me, like literature outside of school work was contraband. And what my, <laughs> and what my mom taught me was always, um, the idea she instilled in me was, on one hand, writing was frivolous, it was useless, it's not in the college entrance exams other than this essay you need to write in a specific format. On the other hand, writing um, is also potentially dangerous and risky. And even as a young child, I couldn't really under, I felt there was a contradiction there. How could something be simultaneously useless and dangerous? Um, but I also understood that um, the natural sciences were the only disciplines I could pursue within China without compromise. And I happened to be very fortunate in the sense that I genuinely love physics and I fell in love with the discipline quite early and the longer I was in the discipline, the more I was in love with it. And so, so I came to the US in 2009 to pursue my PhD in physics and then I was at the University of Chicago and then I graduated in 2015, I continued in my physics career. Um, but 2016 was very, and that was actually life-changing to me, but that also happened to be the year I started reading you. And uh, <laughs> because I, I came to Chicago, I learned about, oh, I came to know Obama's America. And, all, and, I, and in 2016, just shattered everything I thought I knew about this country, about the world and my place in it. And I was also seeing from an ocean away the deteriorating political conditions within China. And so I felt I had things to say but I didn't see anyone writing from my perspective as someone who grew up in China and then was in this position. And so I thought, well, I didn't know how to write at all, but in Chinese there's a saying, wu zhi wu wei, those who do not have knowledge have no fear. So I thought I would just figure out the technical side, like this skill can be trained, but I have things to say that no one else could say for me. And that's how I started writing. Yeah. I. Um I, uh, I th and I think that really does inform um, uh, kind of that, that, that probing sense I always get from reading um, your pieces, that they're always trying to answer questions and they're always trying to explore um, new realms. Um, one question that I'm often asked um, is, do you think being of Chinese heritage gives you, you know, special insight to covering China. And I always feel like that question is entrapment because you say yes, and it feels self-aggrandizing. You say no, and then it's like, why the hell are you here? So I'm not going to, um, I, I'm, I'm gonna reframe that question for you. Um, 
and just ask, what is your relationship um, to writing and how is that affected by being of Chinese heritage and having been reared there? Mm. That is a great and really difficult question. And I think we talked about my physics background. Of course, physics is a discipline that is not known for its demographic diversity. But when I transitioned into writing and China studies and I found, wow, it's whiter. And so that was eye-opening to me. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but I also think this idea of, of ident identity is, um, is interesting because knowledge is always uh, acquired. Right? And, 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 and so, for example, I can write nothing about Yunnan or Dali than Alec <laughs> would be able to because I've never been there. Um, but, but I think what, uh, what happens a lot with identity is, as Jiayang just mentioned, as this entrapment is sometimes I know very well when I'm being tokenized. And I'm, I'm, uh, uh, sometimes one is afforded um, a, a space because their Chinese face offers a token offers a token of authenticity to affirm existing views or or identity is being essentialized and exoticized in a certain way, as if like there is this native informant or <laughs> the way I would put it is sometimes I feel that I'm being placed in a position where I'm like the dragon whisperer that have some unique insight into the Chinese psyche. And and I think what, what really uh, matters here is not, is not identity per se, but relations of power. And, and from what position are we, um, are, are we writing? For what purpose is China being understood on its own terms? Um, or is it being used to project American fears and desires is one thing that I, I see a lot here. So when I write, I, I, I'm, I'm still a Chinese citizen, and, and, I'm, and I'm an academic. I'm not writing to advance any government's agenda, and, and I'm writing in a way, when I said earlier, I, I have things to say that no one else can say for me, and I'm writing from this position of having crossed oceans and borders and having coming and, and also crossed uh, the borders in multiple ways, not just national borders, but disciplinary borders and different things. And, and, that, and that, that informs my position. And I'm not trying to write to be read by the widest, au widest audience or the whitest audience. And <laughs> Right, and so, so, so that is like I, I need to be secure in myself first, and I think I think that is uh, that is probably the position I start with. Um, here is a hard hitting question for you: Have you watched Oppenheimer? I have, and twice. And the first time I went to watch it, I was carded because the movie is R rated, and I felt <laughs> at my age I should take it as a compliment. Oh, no, I think that's the, a compliment of the highest order. I mean, I, for example, no longer get carded anywhere. Um, I, I asked that question because um, I only watched it once, but it, um, it posed this really interesting question um, on the re relationship between science and politics, and that's a subject that you write beautifully about. So I wonder, in this kind of increasingly tense race, I'm sorry for the, um, the sound effect, um, between China and the US, when it comes to technology, when it comes to science, how does being a scientist kind of affect your perspective? Hmm. There, are, um, there, are, uh, there are layers to this. Um, the first part about being, uh, when, when I write a lot about science and policy and especially I think well, Ambassador Lord would um, probably have been part of this during like the first um, agreement signed between the two countries after normalization of relations is the US-China agreement on the cooperation in science technology. And, and in a way, if we date back to the 19th century, one way I say it is about US-China uh, US scientific exchange is as old as US-China relations. Um, however, a lot of times like academia and, and scientific research itself, people who have not directly experienced it may have certain 
stereotypical or, or uh, stereotyped views or caricatured views, and some of that is also the responsibility of scientists that we may not have communicated our profession as well. So there is these uh, technical things that I, I, I bring an understanding to my writing in, in terms of science policy, like how academia actually works, how, sci um, how scientific uh, collaboration and research actually functions, what is the mission, what, what are the motivations and incentive systems. So, so there are these, uh, the, the technical aspects. Um, the second part is with regards to uh, writing. One thing that people, a lot of people ask me was like, oh, you transitioned from physics to China studies and you write. Is that a really drastic or radical shift for you? And, and for me, I really did not feel it is that much of a shift. Because I think like particle physics, I, one way I put it is like we are particle physicists are historians of the universe. And, and physics in a way is to invent and, and find a language to describe the universe. And, and in my physics career, I also did a lot of ex, um, instrumentation in terms of designing uh, particle detectors. So it's a way to, to measure the universe. And on a, uh, in a sense, there is always a limitation, right? There is a, an, an edge to how far we could reach and how precise we, uh, we can measure it. And so what we have is always approximation to the truth. And that is a very much like writing, right? What lands on the page is always approximation to, to what we can have and, and what our duty as writers is to push that edge to, to, to further hone our craft, to invent, to enrich the vocabulary, to stretch the limits of language and to, re, to extend the border of understanding. And so, so to that, um, it is also, I feel, very richly connected. Yeah, I like what you said about kind of um, extending those borders um, and the kind of the scientific rigor that you bring to the experience. Um, something that we share in common that's quite unpleasant is that we have both been trolled, um, sometimes quite heavily. And I can't, I think um, it's hard to not draw the conclusion that it has something to do with us being of Chinese heritage, of being able to read the language of those trolling us and having very vivid memories of going to school and living in um, a homeland that we supposedly betrayed. Um, again, uh, that makes me feel vulnerable as a writer. Um, and I know that, I mean, I have kind of more extended family in, um, in China. I, um, I wonder for you, I mean, as someone who has, I think, immediate family members in China, um, kind of what is the shape of your vulnerability and how does that, how does that affect your writing process? Mm. That is a question I constantly ask myself. So, so I, think, I think for me it comes in, like it's, it's, it's an individual question uh, because it's an individual experience and, and I can only speak from my own, um, my own experience. Because I started writing when I was still in my physics career and, and I, I, I also didn't quite know how to do it so I didn't really think anyone would read me, so, so I didn't really think through all the, all the consequences. But one of the questions I did ask myself before I started writing was, if there are political repercussions, what is the extent I'm willing to ta take? And, and because I felt when I start writing, I cannot self-censor. Uh, my only commitment is to the page and to the truth. And so, so, so I need to be able to have an answer for myself, like, oh, what the extent of political risks, if it happens, then I'll deal with it. I may not be fully um, aware of the extent, but I'm willing to take this risk. And, and that, is, uh, that is the question I resolved for myself before I started writing. Um, but on, on the other hand, I think um, being severed from one's uh, homeland is, is the kind of thing that I think the analogy may be like, facing uh, the, the passing of a, a of a loved one, and I think we both also have uh, intimate experiences with, is something that one can conceptualize infinitely, can intellectualize infinitely, and, and, but one can never really prepare for. And it also, it's a permanent wound. There is no healing, no cure to it, but then one learns to grow around it and then to, um, to have that as a condition of being. And, and also, I think one thing um, that is also very important for me to uh, to, to put into context and put into perspective is that I am physically outside of China. 
And a lot of the things that I write about with regards to political oppression and things is the people who are within China who are facing the, uh, the brunt of it. And of course, um, for people who are physically outside of China, our, re our relationship with, with the country and our identity factors would compound or, or contextualize our risk factors. And, and I, think, I think that is something that I need, I need, to, put in, uh, need to put into perspective. I do not want to exceptionalize um, being trolled on the internet or, 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 or other forms of uh, the, the emotional severance with the other very, very real daily physical threat that someone living inside China have. And I think um, being feeling vulnerable is one way for me to keep that perspective, that I refuse to grow numb and I refuse to um, make this into a technical thing, that I need to be able to feel everything, even if it's visceral, even if it's physical, that provides a context that grounds my an analysis and intellectualizing aspects of it. <laughs> Great, we have 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, I'm gonna go for it. Um, we're gonna run over um, uh, with Alex's permission. Uh, Time is all relative. <laughs> <laughs> that is certainly true. Um, uh, I was, I felt, I was so elated to see you write um, about experiences um, that could have only occurred to those of a, of a younger generation. Like your experience of 89 is very different than mine. I think you were not born, or maybe that was the year you were um, born, and I was still a small, I mean, I was a small child, but I remember it occurring. Um, and seeing your perspective and seeing kind of the things that you would hone in on and what you would pay attention to in the evolution of China was very, um, was frankly very educational to me as someone who's older and um, clearly wouldn't share that perspective. For the younger generation of China watchers, I mean, what do you look forward to reading? I mean, for those who are five, 10 years younger than you, I mean, what, what quality of voice are you looking for? What subjects do you hope um, for them to cover? Hmm. This, uh, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is such a, a great question because then I realize, oh, like many of my students are, are born in, like I was born in the last century compared with them and that is a, is a way to put age into, into perspective. But, but I think on, one thing that I think is interesting is uh, touching, touching on Ian's point about, about technology, about, uh, about internet and digital, uh, digital media. Actually, because of this, my strict upbringing, I actually wasn't allowed to use a computer because that's not in the college entrance exams. And so I only <laughs> learned how to use a computer at university. And, and so, so I think uh, for, for, um, for, for, I will call them kids, for kids who are, um, who are, who people may call digital natives, how, um, how, how their access to information and also how their relationship with the language is formed, um, is shaped by these di digital platforms would create a different, uh, different experience because when, when I was growing up in China, when you were growing up in China, our experience was still physical. But for a lot of the uh, younger generations, their physical reality is one thing, but what they experience in digital space may be a great, uh, the majority part of their actual interactions. And, and then also the digital space is a place with, of immense creativity with regards to language, including all these different kinds of fake languages like Martians or even like uh, the, the fictional <laughs> languages like Klingons that are used to translate <laughs> banned, word, banned texts in Chinese, right? And so, so there is a great creativity there and these are some of the things that I really, um, I've been seeing and I really look, look forward to reading more. And also for the younger generation who experienced their formative years during COVID lockdown, I think that is an experience I wouldn't know firsthand, and that's all something I look forward to reading. Terrific, well we, ha we definitely have that to look forward to um, reading, and um, thank you for letting me go over by two minutes and 53 seconds. <laughs> um. Thank you, Jia Yang, thank you, Yang Yang, for exploring the edges of what it means to write about China.
and the prisms through which we see it. So uh, we did it. We got through six decades of China writing. Thank you and watching. Um, more or less on time. Um, and in just a moment, uh, I will invite you to go directly upstairs where there is free alcohol uh, until nine o'clock. Um, and, and I also invite you to continue reading some of the voices that you've heard here tonight and many more at China Books Review. And to leave you with a final hope or a final act of hopism, as Jian Ying put it, um, I hope that uh, over the next six decades uh, that we see a positive direction of channel for a positive direction of travel for China uh, and for the Sinophone world and for writings about China. Uh, and I also hope that uh, 60 years from now, anyone interested in intelligent commentary and interested to seek out the best books on China uh, will be reading about it all at chinabooksreview.com. So thank you for coming. See you upstairs.